Um, well, thanks a lot. This is a good crowd for Monday night. I appreciate you guys coming out on uh, uh, college football championship night and debut of Bachelor Bachelorette night, which I was kind of worried about going up against. Um, I've been going around. This is my last stop on my tour to uh, promote this book. There is this obvious gambit of secession, and there is a serious uh, message behind the book. But a lot of it is supposed to be played for laughs, and there's clearly uh, a Swiftian proposition, Swiftian element behind the proposition for uh, secession that um, seems like a lot of people kind of miss. But um, there is also a little bit more of a serious angle in the book. So I'm going to go ahead and throw, let's go ahead and do these slides. Is that cool? Uh, this thing is kind of, this is, this is a little bit that I often do when I'm down south, it's a little bit regionally loaded right now, but I'm um, thinking that some people might hear, might recognize this as the uh, Boeing assembly plant up there in Everett, which is a really cool uh, thing. If you, have, if you live up here or even you're just visiting and you haven't toured that facility, it's really incredible. They call it the largest uh, freestanding building by volume in the world. It's 473 million cubic feet. There it goes. There's a whole bunch of different bays under one roof. It just kind of goes both directions. They're assembling dreamliners here in this section. Um, there's a, supposedly a building opening up in Chengdu, China in uh, June of 2013 that's going to be larger than this. But at least for now, it seems to be the largest freestanding building in the world. Uh, one of the reasons I show, I open up when I'm down south with the, uh, the Boeing plant is to talk a little bit about the chapter on economics. Um, I don't really need to explain here to anybody how uh, important Boeing is to the region, but some of you might not know that uh, the Boeing company, um, per dollar since the 1940s, since 1947, is every single year is the single largest exporter in this country and has been every year since, um, since the end of World War II, basically. It's an incredibly important, uh, strategically imp uh, important company to this country, both in terms of uh, civilian aviation. I mean, they provide, along with Airbus, you know, most of the long haul uh, aircraft around the world. Obviously, militarily, uh, you know, Boeing's been involved in B-17s, B-29s, B-52s, you know, the, the planes that, that helped win World War II, um, F-18s, you know, the top guns of Apache helicopters. Um, and the Boeing company and the aeronautics industry in the Pacific Northwest is really under attack right now from southern states, um, which are, virulently anti-union states' right to work, which to me is one of these Orwellian nonsense terms. Um, I'm, I'm really going to be very unapologetically pro-union guy. I belonged to unions before. All right. I don't get that down south. <laughs> um, but uh, some of you might not know that in uh, last year, last summer, June, uh, the state of Alabama handed uh, the Airbus company, $160 million in both cash and tax breaks as an incentive to come and build Airbus aircraft in the United States. Uh, that's Boeing's most direct competition is Airbus, as probably a lot of you guys know. Um, other southern states have been banding together uh, trying to get Airbus into um, South Carolina, Tennessee, Florida. Um, and basically... What the South did to, you know, every, everybody thinks that the auto industry in this country is dead, right? Well, Detroit's really hurting, but the auto industry in this country is thriving. It's just thriving in the South, um, in Tennessee and Texas and Alabama and South Carolina. And basically what happened was southern states went to um, auto manufacturers and promised uh, about 30% lower wages for their people, fewer benefits, fewer regulations on, on factories and emissions and things like that. And lured uh, a bunch of jobs from, from Detroit down south. And that's what's going on right now in, in the aeronautics industry in a very big way. Um, and one, one way that, uh, that southern states are able to do this is, is by, you know, you, you often hear about this kind of corrupt business practices and cronyism in the south and this and that sort of thing. Well, that's wired into their state constitutions. It, it's, it's not just... Um, it's not just by happenstance that you can have, that Alabama can give Airbus $158 million. Uh, the Washington State Constitution forbids using, giving gifts to, to corporations, public funds. You have to pay you know, for services rendered or goods received by the state constitution. Washington's gotten around that a few times to, to give Boeing a few breaks. But in general, um, you're not allowed to just take public funds and hand them to a company as a gift. You're allowed to do that in Alabama. It's part of their state constitution. There's no restrictions against that. 
So it really gives an unfair advantage to, to southern states. And, and this whole kind of right to work plague that's taking over the country, I think, is, is really dangerous. I write about it in the book. Um, this past summer or spring, I guess, Indiana became the 23rd state in the union to adopt right to work laws. Um, since ni from between 1973 and 2007, private sector union membership in this country went from 34% to 8%. During the exact same period, the disparity, the gulf between uh, revenues and payments between ownership and labor uh, grew by 40% in ownership's favor. Basically, for every 1.5% of union jobs lost, uh, for every 2% of union jobs lost, about 1.5% uh, difference between pay between ownership and labor. That's what you get. That's the formula. That's per um, The Economist. So I kind of talk um, a lot about that in the book. Um, a lot of you probably know about South Carolina snagging a, um, a Dreamliner assembly plant. It was a big, uh, big to-do about that um, some years ago. So that's part, that's part of the economic, um, the economic chapter of the book. This is the Port of Savannah. This photo here is just kind of meant to show that um, you know, the South, far from being the, the nation's number one economic problem, as famously declared by FDR in 1938, the South is really an economic juggernaut along with the West. It's, it's kind of the twin spear tip of um, economic growth and, and dynamism in this country. It's where all the investment's going, um, a lot of new manufacturing. I mean, for some of those reasons that I outlined and others, you know, cheaper labor force, much more compliant state and local governments, things like that. Um, so this is, um, you know, the South, for most of its history, the South was kind of a broken economic model. But since World War II, it's really, um, that's changed. This is kind of a classic um, Southern conflating patriotism with the, with the oil war there. Um, no surprise, by the way, that um, among legislative resistance to sort of green technology, the, the, the heaviest of it comes from the oil states. I mean, that's just self-interest, I guess. But, um, you know, most of those, Texas, Louisiana, those, those are kind of the um, representatives in Washington that are the most hot-headed about um, resisting any kind of green technology. Um, not all bad in the south. This is Savannah. This is uh, Whitaker Street, Forsyth Park there, about three or four blocks from Paula Deen's uh, Butterfest restaurant. Where I ate a couple times. It's nice, you know, touring around the South. It's a pretty place. Um, I wasn't, you know, I didn't go down South just to kind of pick on the whole thing and hate it all. This is a nice little swimming hole in Tennessee uh, that a guy took me to. Uh, that's the one-man frat on the right. <laughs> this is just, this is just to show that uh, Pac-10 fans and SEC fans can get along here. This was down at that uh, game of the century in Tuscaloosa. Um, some fans easier to get along with than others. And uh, this was kind of more typical of the interactions we have with a lot of fans down there whenever we would try to challenge the notion of SEC supremacy. As it turns out, this guy was actually from Ohio State. <laughs> but uh, it was no nonetheless kind of typical of things. This was probably the coolest subculture I stumbled upon in the South. I had no idea that these um, black cowboys existed down in Louisiana and eastern Texas and parts of Arkansas. They call this thing trail rides. And there's a, a huge, uh, well, I don't know huge, but fairly substantial African-American community of um, cowboys and sort of, you know, horse owners and whatnot. And, and just as, as recreation, sort of a family thing, get together, uh, these guys often get together on weekends, anywhere from 20 to two or 300 of them. And they ride around in the countryside and then come back and have a big barbecue party. Um, this was in a place called Bro Bridge, Louisiana, uh, where I just got absolutely lucky and was talking to a, a front desk clerk at a day's Inn that I was staying there. And she told me and this guy, Paulo, Dr. Barr, who shows up in the book a little bit, about this event. We drove out in the middle of this field in the middle of the night, and there was this Zydeco band playing. It was really a lot of fun. And I went back, then it was a two-day event, and I went back the next day and kind of interviewed people and talked to them when I wasn't shoving my face full of barbecue and beer. Uh, this is a guy named Charles Gibbs. He's a pastor at the West Mobile Baptist Church. He was one of my favorite guys I met down uh, during my travels. He's a really sharp guy. He's, he's talked about in the book, as is his West Mobile Baptist Church. Uh, you know, he was a really fun guy to talk to and debate with about kind of the role that religion plays in public life in the South, you know, my, my issues with inserting religion into the, into the public debate. Um, this is a little less clear-headed piece of religion down there in the South. 
This is, some, maybe somebody recognized it. Anybody know where this is? Yeah, there we go. Petersburg, Kentucky. That's the Creation Museum. And that is where you find young little cute cave girls cavorting with baby dinosaurs. And, and by the way, these guys aren't part of the attraction. They look like models, but they were real kids, as you can see by their Crocs. <laughs> but they were pretty perfect. I saw, oh, I've got to get this shot. Whipping out my camera. So, um, but the Creation Museum is pretty trippy, and it's, you know, it's a lot less to do with creation than it is to me about um, just kind of, uh, just kind of this idea that there's this grand government conspiracy afoot to sort of shroud the truth from our children, kind of in the way that t-shirt, you know, our school's wrong, the South is right. There's a lot of this kind of stuff, you know, as though, geez, they're, they're not telling me about the dinosaurs and the little kids playing together, you know. Um, no, no, they're not all sticks in the mud down there. This is a sexy Eve, and Adam was kind of good-looking himself. I didn't, I don't get a shot of him, but he was pretty built, as you can see there. So there's several of these um, sort of Adam and Eve dioramas there. But this is kind of, you, you find a, a big, a lot of dinosaurs. So they're very into dinosaurs there. They're into using dinosaurs to disprove evolution somehow, which to me would be the last thing I'd grasp for if I'm trying to disprove evolution. <laughs> But so there's a lot, this is in the children's section. Well, it's all, you know, sort of redundant, but um, this is where, you know, you go in and it's a little thing like you'd see in a museum for kids, that, you know, and you flip up the thing and here's the answer. Uh, yes, God made Adam and Eve on the same day as land animals, day six. So that means dinosaurs and people lived at the same time. Like, oh, no sh <laughs> Now, in the adult section, they'll give you the, you know, the book of Genesis or whatever that that, that quote comes from, but. They're just kind of easing the kids into it from that. So anyway, a, a big, a big um, part of the religion chapter, to me, uh, the religion was the first chapter in the book. And it's the first chapter in the book because, as far as I'm concerned, it's kind of the, the foundation of a lot of social thought and, and politics. And religion seems to seep into virtually every aspect of Southern life football, education. And so it, it, it to me, is, is kind of the real thing that separates um, uh, southern states from, from northern states. Now, granted, I mean, the obvious kickback argument to that is, well, there's, you know, religious kooks in all 50 states. And, yeah, there are. That's obvious. I mean, I, I come from Alaska, and we've got one of the more infamous religious. You know what's really my neighbor, Greg Lang, who I haven't seen since. Where's Greg? Hey, man, thanks for coming. So I, I grew up in Juneau. Greg lived next door to our house at a time when, uh, Dudley and Tongas were dirt roads. In fact, it was rural Route 4 when we were first growing up there. It's now paved. Um, but, you know, when you used to, I've traveled around a lot. When, when you tell people you're from Alaska, the first thing they would ask you about would be the northern lights or how it's all dark all winter. But now when you tell them you're from Alaska, <laughs> they ask you about Sarah Palin, <laughs> which is really depressing that Sarah Palin is now more famous than the northern lights. So I've kind of stopped even bothering with the, yeah, Alaska. It's not so cool anymore that Palin ruined it for us. Um, but anyway, the point about religion is, yeah, all, that stuff exists in all 50 states, but only in southern states is there a large enough voting quorum that candidates for public office can appeal to voters on explicitly religious grounds. You know, I'm anti-abortion because God said so, or I'm against gay marriage because God says it's an abomination. And you can do that in the South with a reasonable expectation of success. If you, you can do that in Washington or Oregon or most other states, and you'll probably get an instant 10, 15, 20% of you know, voter sympathy. But it's really in the South where you can appeal to people on explicitly religious grounds and expect to probably get elected somewhere. Um, and that's what, to me, makes the difference in, in the religious argument uh, between Southern states and Northern states. Um, so, I did, as uh, was mentioned in the intro, I did two books on World War II sites around uh, the world. And this thing really looks like something that uh, Hitler would have constructed for the Atlantic Wall defenses over there in uh, Northern Europe. Anybody know what this building is? Jail, yeah, good one. Uh, did I hear something? All right, it's the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery. You're about the second person that's ever got that. So that's the Southern Poverty Law Center, which, if you don't know what that is, is um, uh, an organization that was uh, born out of the Civil Rights Movement by a couple of lawyers, uh, I think from Alabama. Shoot, I want to say Morris Deez is from Arkansas. I don't know suddenly. 
Alabama, okay. Well, this is in Montgomery, Alabama. And yeah, right? It's, I mean, if, if, if uh, as I, it's sort of siege mentality architecture right here. <laughs> but for a good reason, because there's been, um, there's been 26 different uh, bombing attempts. I'll go back on this real quick. I'll get to that in a second. 26 different attempts to, to bomb that building since it was uh, constructed in the 1970s. Um, it's on Washington Avenue there in Montgomery, which is a really interesting street historically in the United States. You've got the first White House of the Confederacy uh, was there where, where Jefferson Davis and his group of farsighted thinkers, you know, plotted their their revenge against the highly mechanized North, richer and more populous. And anyway, uh, right across the street from that is the State Capitol building, which was the scene of a lot of events, such as the conclusion of the um, March from Selma in, I want to say, 65. Somebody's probably going to correct me. Um, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center is there on the street, and across from that is the, um, I think this is called the National Civil Rights Memorial. And if that looks kind of familiar, it was designed by Maya Lin, who is the woman who also designed the Vietnam uh, Memorial in, on the Mall in Washington, D.C. And uh, it's, it's very, you know, it's very moving memorial to go to. This is this kind of dial with water, and, and those inscriptions there are, um, you know, mileposts or important significant events in, in the civil rights era. So it's kind of, you can see how that works and, you know, all those little markers that kind of goes around and follows the whole thing. So it's a, it's a really uh, interesting memorial. But um, as I said, there's been a lot, of, a lot of animosity down there toward the Southern Poverty Law Center. And, and uh, I, I spent a day hanging around talking to some of the attorneys, some of the editors, researchers, and um, other people down there. And they said that the... You know, the, the sort of vitriol, the local vitriol um, toward them has, has softened somewhat in the last um, five or ten years, but it's still there. Most of the people who are in the public eye that work there are under 24-hour security. Their homes are under a watch and all that sort of stuff. Um, so <laughs> this is the part of the book that has kind of got me the most um, criticism of the book. It's a guy named John Howard. He's in a town called Lawrence, South Carolina. He is, by his own admission, a former... Grand Dragon and the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so I spent uh, a few hours with him. He runs a little shop called the Redneck Shop. Um, none of the stuff I gave you tonight was from his shop, by the way, so your hands are clean if you're worried about um, supporting him. But I talked to my editor before. You know, I wrote this little section up with John Howard. When I went down to research the, the race and racism chapter for this book, uh, I really wanted to avoid the shooting fish in a barrel kind of deal. I wanted to avoid guys like John Howard because, um, you know, we all know they exist. They've been documented to death. I don't really have anything new to add to this story about Southern racism. And anyway, I really wanted to examine sort of mainstream Southern Moors. I wanted to kind of make the case that Southern states are, you know, in, in the mainstream, not in the fringe, not the, not the kooks and weirdos like this guy, um, that, you know, the South really is operating in a fundamentally different way than the rest of the country. But, Howard was a pretty interesting guy, and a lot of things happened in South Carolina while I was there and in the South, just in, the, in about the two years that I was researching this book, that made me feel that it was justified to, to have him, um, to include him in the book, for which, you know, a lot of places like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and other kind of high-profile reviews of this book have really uh, criticized me and criticized the book for including this guy, for me not doing the kind of... Um, you know, the polite southern thing and turning a blind eye to those quaint little guys known for their pointy hoods and white sheets. But in just the two years that I was in the south, in Newberry, South Carolina, um, a white guy shot a black guy in the back of the head, tied him to the back of his pickup truck by a rope and drug him about 10 miles down a state highway before he was picked up by the cops. Um, state Senator Jake Knott, sitting state senator uh, on a live podcast called Barack Obama and Nikki Haley, a raghead, uh, ended up keeping his um, his Senate seat despite a little bit of pressure to give it up. That ended quickly. Jake Knotts did lose his seat, by the way, in November. Um, Rusty DePass, a former um, Republican Election Commission chairman, uh, a gorilla escaped from the Columbia Zoo, and he immediately went on record as uh, comparing that gorilla to Michelle Obama and her family. Uh, state GOP uh, Jim DeMint, who's in the U.S. Senate, 
uh, uh, he was praised by a couple of Republicans in the state for acting like a Jew for his uh, behavior on, um, with budget negotiations. Uh, a 2011 poll of South Carolina Republicans showed that 46% said interracial marriage should be illegal. Um, I mean, I can't even believe we're asking that question in 2011 personally, and nearly half of Republicans said no. Uh, in 2012, a poll of likely voters said 34% down there either said it was, should be illegal or they weren't sure. Um, so I thought, you know what, all this stuff happened and everybody wants to really complain. This is a sign in, in John Howard's shop. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's like, f fuck it, I'm not going to be all polite and sit here and ignore this stuff, you know. Um, Right down the street, this was one of the, probably the most surreal thing ever in the two years that I did this research. Um, right down the street from John Howard, five storefronts or six storefronts, is this place called Wallace Creations. It's an African-American barbershop, just like you see in the movies and whatnot, right? So I walked down. As soon as I came out of the Klan shop, there, were these, there was this guy, this big burly dude who's not in this picture, kind of staring at me coming out of the Klan shop. Went, oh, fuck. And I had my bag of shit. <laughs> I bought a Klan outfit from John Howard because I wanted to prove that you could do it. It cost me 125 bucks, and I, I, didn't, I don't bring in show up, but I do have it. But I had that in this little damn transparent bag. <laughs> so I kind of go walking over to the guy, hey, what's up, man? <laughs> anyway, I, talk, I spent about three hours. This is a Friday night, and I spent about three hours from about 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock in here and uh, talking to these guys. This is this guy writing down his email address for me. And I asked them, so what's the deal with um, this guy and his clan shop that's right on the same street? It's right across from the city courthouse or the county courthouse. And I said, is, is this guy just this sort of, you know, anomaly, this, this you know, what's, what's, I'm suddenly looking for the, it's not an anachronism. Is he just this kind of hanger on from this past time that's just kind of tolerated? Or does he somehow represent you know, the prevailing, you know, mindset of the white community in this town. And I'm not going to tell you what they said. They'll be my only teaser of the night. I think their answer is on page, like, 112 or 113 of the book. But um, so it, it just really, talk about it. It was a very bizarre experience to spend, you know, an hour and a half with the Grand Dragon guy and then literally walk down the street and there's those guys. So here's the South Carolina State Capitol. I guess I'm picking on South Carolina right now, but what the hell, they deserve it, I think. This is easily the most dysfunctional state in the union, I'm telling you. Anybody from South Carolina here? Uh, okay, we, no, don't be, don't be sorry. I mean, there's a lot of nice things about it, and if you want to, I'm happy to be disagreed with, but so, um, so uh, some point in you know, 2001, 2002, as you might recall, there was this huge controversy about the Confederate flag being on top of the South Carolina state capitol, and there were several similar uh, Confederate flag controversies around the South during the same period. Um, the guy who was at the time the president of the Senate, a guy named Glenn McConnell, um, engineered this, this compromise that, okay, well, after, you know, this horrible debate and the NAACP gets involved and Jesse Jackson comes down and he's complaining and all the crazy rednecks come out to say F you to them. They say, okay, look, let's, we'll make a deal. We're going to take that flag. Off. We, we, we get it. You guys are bummed out. This is not good for the state. We'll take that flag off the top of the Capitol. And we'll build a corral put it right in front of the fucking building where it's even more conspicuous than it was before. Even more, and where it gets lit up at night and so everybody can see it. That's what they did in South Carolina. So you cruise around the, the South Carolina state grounds and you see an absolute shrine everywhere you go to white supremacy. This is Ben Tillman, who uh, is one of the most vehement white supremacists this country has ever produced. This guy who publicly advocated lynching any black person who tries to vote. Uh, I got his quote down here, so I'm going, toward the end of his life, he said, he was in the Senate, I think he might have been uh, governor for a while. Uh, we have scratched our heads to find out how we could eliminate every last one of them. He's talking about African Americans. Uh, we stuffed ballot boxes, we shot them, we are not ashamed of it. So he's honored there. This is Wade Hampton, uh, who was an undeniably uh, brilliant military strategist. He was a Civil War general. He was also, at the start of the Civil War, uh, one of the largest slaveholders in the United States and quite possibly the largest slaveholder in the world. Um, after the war, he was um, senator, uh, he was governor for a while, and he really led the charge to, to overthrow any sort of reconstruction uh, era efforts to sort of engage and include African Americans in the political process and really set up 
um, you know, the apparatus to deny blacks uh, equal rights under the law, the sort of thing that led to Jim Crow laws. So he's there. Um, this, by the way, is Glenn McConnell. He is the current sitting lieutenant governor of South Carolina, former Senate president of South Carolina, a guy who was described to me by Republican and Democratic um, political insiders as the most powerful man in South Carolina. So when people, uh, you know, kind of take me to task and criticize the book for including a three-page section with a Klan guy who's selling all this stuff and doing this, and this is the, this is the guy who's the lieutenant governor of your state, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, that's old Glenn back there is the, dressed as the private. No, he's the, uh, he's the ugly fucker in the middle. Um, yeah, and this is just more of this. I'll kind of wrap you through this. But, I mean, essentially, it's, uh, it's kind of the, yeah, I was supposed to roll through these. I haven't done this little thing. Oh, yeah, this was a really weird thing, this green guy that the, that the, uh, yeah, that's the guy who got dragged 11 miles behind the truck. Uh, yeah, this, uh, you know, as though anybody's surprised, as soon as that bowling plant moved out to South Carolina, the sort of race issue started cropping up there. So that's all just stuff so you know I'm not BSing anybody. Uh, Central Little Rock High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, famous for the Little Rock Nine, 1957. hope I'm getting all this right. Um, nine students, African-American students, you know, trying to segregate uh, the school led to a pretty huge standoff between the federal government and the state of Arkansas. You can visit that thing today. It's a national park. It's the only national park that's also an operating school. And they have preserved Central Little Rock High School to look exactly like it did in 1957. You go inside, same old school clocks are on the wall, and uh, across the street there's a gas station that's been preserved in, the, in its 1957 state. This is the Arkansas State Capitol. That's a statue of the Little Rock Nine that um, then Governor Clinton had commissioned. And these, these guys uh, are looking up at the governor's office, which I believe that's the governor's office. One of those windows, anyway, is the governor's office. And Clinton had that uh, statue put there to look up at his office. This is also in Little Rock. The education chapter I did, this is a um, public forum where uh, they, were, they were looking for a new uh, superintendent of schools in Little Rock, and I went to a lot of the public forums that they held to, you know, get public input on, you know, what type of superintendent are we looking for, what, what are the strengths and weaknesses of our district, you know, that kind of thing. They're soliciting public input. So I went to that meeting. This is a guy named Tom Jacobson, who was from a consulting group from Nebraska that uh, Little Rock School District hired to help them find their new superintendent. This is a lot of what I did as part of research for the book. I mean, I know this isn't a very exciting photo, um, but a lot of the research wasn't terribly exciting. But I went to these types of public meetings, sat in, listened to things, you know, went up to people afterwards, talked to them, and, you know, did a ton of interviews, talked to hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, that's just one of them. And I wrote about in the education chapter uh, that search for Little Rock. This is my leg, so this is also to prove to you that this was, a, this was from a, a, a bed bug incident in Georgia at a very... <laughs> People think when you publish a book, you've got a lot of money all of a sudden, but let me tell you, you don't really make that much money. You stay in really crappy little days ends and things like this happen to you. Uh, this was kind of cool. Their joke there, when you go to Hale, Louisiana, they say, well, now you've been to Hale and back. But a lot of flags down there in the south. I just thought this was funny. I don't know. <laughs> I hear like 10 funny things going on in that to me. From her name. And this is in George, Mississippi, which is allegedly the most racist county in all of the United States. So I had to go to see what the most racist county in the U.S. looked like. And as soon as I got to the city hall in Loosedale, here's these two black guys in prison garb in front of the city. I thought, God, what better representation? Uh, what can I... Some days you just get lucky when you're the traveling rider. <laughs> um, but if you read the acknowledgments, I, I couldn't find a spot to put them in the book, but they show up in there. This is, um, all right, anybody want to guess who this is? Famous Southern politician from Louisiana. It's Huey Long, who is the you know, quasi-subject of all the King's men, a couple of Roderick like Crawford played him and Sean Penn and other people. Um, he's down there in Winfield, Louisiana. 
This is a really interesting thing. I don't know where the South turned the corner that all government is evil. You know what Huey Long's campaign slogan was when he was running for governor two straight times? It was the great share our wealth society. That is exactly what Huey Long ran. He was a complete populist. It was all about sharing our wealth. And it's amazing to me that you know, all these Southerners love using their highways and their bridges and their hospitals and their football stadiums that were all built on public funds as though they just appeared out of nowhere and nobody actually paid for them. Nobody did the work to make them. Um, you know, don't take away that football stadium at LSU that Huey Long built with public funds, but you know, the government's all evil. I don't know where quite that happened. Uh, this will be the last little vignette here. There's about two or three slides. So when you travel around the South, as I'm sure a lot of you have done, you go to these little towns, there's always a Confederate monument, <clears throat> monument to the Confederate soldiers and the slain heroes and all that sort of stuff. And you pass by these things, and, you know, they look like any sort of monument in little towns. And they're fine, but if you go up and actually read them, I found it just remarkable uh, what you find inscribed on these stone monuments, all, all the way from Mississippi to Florida to Georgia. This one happens to be in Abbeville, South Carolina, but it's very typical of the kind of things that you see on, on these uh, monuments. I'll, I'll read this to you in case you can't read it, but this reads, the world shall yet decide in truth's clear far off light that the soldiers who wore the gray and died with Lee were in the right. Right? Not, not that these Confederate soldiers were brave or that they responded to a sort of call of duty or patriotism, but they were right. And to me, the only way to really interpret this kind of inscription is that the cause for which the South fought, which was slavery, and now everyone wants to give you the BS about states' rights. Well, the state right that they gave a shit about was slavery. There's a really nice book called Apostles of Disunion by a Southerner named Charles Dew. It's very short. It's about 112 pages. And in it, he collects all of the uh, documents, the, the sort of secession documents that each state put together. You know, we are seceding because, and slavery is mentioned in virtually the first line or first paragraph of every single one of those documents. It's just, it's, not, it's a joke that people tell you that the South wasn't seceding for slavery. Now, they wanted the state right to hang on to slavery to protect their ec economy, right? That's what it was based on, slave labor. But clearly that's why they were fighting the war. And this monument, by the way, you might think, well, okay, this was erected in the sort of emotional aftermath of war and on and on and on. This monument was originally erected in 1902, and it was refurbished in 1994, um, you know, 100, close to 150 years later, 140 years or whatever uh, after the war. So, so clearly that sort of it ain't over uh, mentality still exists down there. Now this is the last one. This is a really interesting uh, monument. It's in Washington, D.C. And I wrote down the name of it because it's got a very long name. I want to get it right. That's the National Japanese American Memorial to Patriotism during World War II. It's at the corner of D Street and Jersey Avenue in Washington, D.C. This thing was uh, dedicated by Ronald Reagan in 1988. And the words that he used to dedicate uh, this statue or, or this uh, memorial are written. I've got these down too. He said, here we admit a wrong. This is in 1988. Here we admit a wrong. Here we affirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under the law. So to me, you, you can't really come up with a more succinct crystallization of two societies that are really moving in the opposite direction, right? This one here, which is, we were right, goddammit, and we will be proven right. I don't care if it takes 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. We were right. That is the mentality in the South. And this is the mentality of the country that I live in, and this is the mentality of the country that I want to live in. Right? Nobody was saying that, uh, that that horrible spectacle and what happened in World War II with Japanese Americans was right. In fact, after some period of self-reflection, most of the country has said, you know what? That was really bad. <laughs> we were wrong. Now, let's try to atone for this in the best way we can and move forward and have a, a you know, harmonious, decent country. So that to me is really the, the, the crystallization of, and this is my last slide if you want to pull this thing down and pull the lights up, but of the, <clears throat> of the two halves of the, of the country. And as I said, the one that I prefer to, to be a part of and the one that I think the majority of Southern voters uh, tend to want to be a part of. So that's my dog and pony and slide and t-shirt show for you about this book. <laughs> and yeah. 
So this gentleman says that he travels, takes road trips down south, maybe for a week or two at a time in Mississippi. He's asking sort of the way that I conducted my travels and, and trips while I was in the south. <clears throat> Generally, I did have an idea where I wanted to go. I did, before I write any book, I do anywhere from three months to a year's worth of research online, reading books, making phone interviews, this and that sort of thing. And I have an idea of the kind of people that I want to talk to. I knew they were looking for doing a superintendent search in Little Rock, so I planned to be there during that process. Um, I talked to some professors, for example, at the University of Georgia and made appointments to see them. So typically what I would do would, would have one or two reasons to go somewhere. I'd either you know, interview somebody or watch a football game or whatever. And then I would kind of play it by ear, see who I met, mingle around with people. I did have a few free days where I would just hang around and go to parks and go to bar. One of the weird sort of stupid things about being a writer, every, most writers hate, is you have to kind of force yourself onto strangers. I'm the kind of people, I don't like when strangers talk to me personally. I'm, I'm weirded out by it, but so you have to kind of be the guy at the bar that strikes up a conversation just so you can talk to people. But it's easier to do at bars, especially if you buy people drinks, they'll talk to you a little more. But that's basically I had an outline of things I wanted to do or people I wanted to talk to, events I wanted to see, and then um, kind of kind of winged it from there. Um, are you coming up to ask? Yeah, yeah, do it. Bring it on. So you got through your uh, whole talk today without mentioning secession. So was that just a, you know, a Swiftian device that you wanted to structure the book around, or do you think that's a real possibility? <laughs> well, both. You know what? Yeah, it is a little bit of a Swiftian device. Look, I, I went into this, uh, into this project with this idea that I was going to argue for secession, but I also knew that it was an absurd idea, that it's not really ever going to happen, and that it might not even be that good of an idea. But about six months into the process, when I was really starting to get a handle on what to me is how very different um, southern states are set up, especially when I started looking into their state constitutions, the way they funded education, which is completely different from the way most of the rest of the country does, which is why southern states always perform very poorly in academic testing. Not because they're stupid or anything, but because they just simply don't fund their schools to the degree that anybody else does. But after about six or eight months of this, I remember sending an email to my editor and saying, I'm getting kind of worried. I'm kind of starting to buy my own bullshit here. I think this is kind of a good idea now. <laughs> and she said, well, just go with it, man. It's good if you believe it. But you know, I do kind of believe that it would be worth <laughs> doing. I think it'll probably happen at some point, not in our lifetimes, but I just think it sort of has to. Um, but I do, I, I am a realist. It's not going to happen. Um, just the economics make it make it impossible, but uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I think it'd be a, a worthwhile thing to pursue. Really, I grew up in South Carolina, um, not far from Newberry actually, and uh, my family's been there since uh, before the revolution. And uh, so there's a thing about secession and uh, going to school, growing up, and hearing about secession and hearing about civil war and knowing exactly what that does to a culture, the war and whatnot, what happened to everyone involved, not, not just the slaves, but to the people that fought. And, you know, I have relatives or people back that were Confederate soldiers. I'm not saying it was right. I'm not saying, you know, whatever. I moved to Washington for a reason. Um, but in that, Civil War is an awful thing, and there was so much horror, and it lasts for generations and generations and generations. You know, they came through and burnt my hometown to the ground when, you know, they weren't doing good things there. But to say that one of the big problems I see with the South is rhetoric and uh, spewing out ideas that haven't been really thought about enough to say, like, oh, well, this this maybe isn't the right thing to say, this could inflame people, but this right here, with the joking and everything like that, or saying like, yeah, we should secede from the Union, there's a, that's really kind of saying like how, I don't even know how to put it, it's really dangerous, and. Um, What's dangerous about it? I mean, what if it's a good idea? It's I mean, not, not a good idea, the though. Think about the people that are left behind, and think about the fight and the bloodbath that comes with that. It's not a good thing. This is, this is kind of my take on that, <clears throat> that uh, a majority of people in a society should be allowed to set the rules and govern their society the way that they see fit. And this whole project for me kind of got started with 
<clears throat> thinking that this realization that in as much as I am sick and tired of people like Newt Gingrich and Mitch McConnell and, and uh, Eric Cantor having an impact on my country, quote unquote, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to say it's my country, but I think there's so many people in the South and in other parts of the country that are sick and tired of having people like Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama and Harry Reid have an impact on their country. And shouldn't, shouldn't sort of collective mores and a majority opinion and, and kind of a manageable geographic area be the things around which a society are built rather than this sprawling landscape and the chance tentacles of history and this voracious federal government that tries to get its fangs into every single piece of it. I mean, if, 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 if enough people, if enough people over a long period of time really want to live by the Ten Commandments and inscribe, inscribe those things at the front of every legislative body and schoolhouse in their country, well, who am I to stand in their way? Let them, you know? And as far as the left behind, um, a lot of people say that, well, that's really not good. You're going to leave behind a lot of liberals, a lot of African Americans. What's to become of them? And you know, I think that just, yeah, you know, I think that just underscores how different these two societies. If it's really to the point where it's like leaving soldiers behind an enemy line, I'm I'm tired of the fight. I just am. You know, this country is in absolute gridlock. I'm sick of it, and I've given up the. It's like you know what? Fine, win. Take your take your God-based society, and and your uh, exploitation of workers and all that and. God bless you. Have at it, man. I'm just frustrated. It's a book of frustration. At the same time, I know that it's not going to happen. So, I mean, I don't know that that's a satisfactory answer to you. I can tell you're, you, know, you feel emotional about it. But I'm emotional about it on the other side. I am just frustrated with it. My experiences with running into progressive religious groups and how... Progressive... Um, well, I talked to plenty of progressives and plenty of um, religious people who were sane, moderate, normal people that weren't this sort of, you know... We hate gays, get it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I just handled them the way I handle progressives and liberals and religious, moderate religious people anywhere. I mean, I... You know, for the most part, people kind of, the liberal element, the progressive element, seems to have sort of given up. They say, man, what are we supposed to do? Man, it just sucks. This is how it is. That's, now, that's not 100%, but for the most part, I'd say a good 80%. Um, they just say, you know, hey, man, there's a lot of liberals down here, you know. I say, yeah, I know. I've got friends. You know, I've got family in Georgia. I've been going down there since I was 10 years old. Um, so. so the question is about brain drain from the South, Southern liberals who are sort of disgusted with the South and moved to other parts of the country or the world. Well, that certainly happens, but I don't, I don't think so, no. The fact is more people are moving into the South for employment than are moving away from it. The South is rapidly um, expanding its population base, which, which – to me, it makes it all the more frightening that, that this gigantic conservative organism is, is going to have more and more influence on, on you know, your life and my life. Um, so, no, I mean, yeah, certainly there are some, you know, intelligent southern liberals or conservatives, whoever, that just leave the South for one reason or another. But for the most part, the South right now is a net gainer, not a, not a net loser in, in that sort of thing. Uh, I think there was a woman over here, a man. Sorry. I would like to see you put more attention into the practicalities of uh, secession because it is not unprecedented in the modern world. We've had India broke up into Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Burma, and then South Sudan, Slovakia, other modern examples, Soviet Union breaking up. So Scotland is probably going to tear off And Ukraine. maybe Quebec. Yeah. His, well, I guess I don't need to repeat it. He was in the microphone. Yeah. Um, there's some talk in the book about the practicalities about how this secession thing might work. Probably I was more interested in, in the book in examining the modern South and trying to build a case that the South really is a different society than the rest of the country. That's, that's a big debate among Southern historians and people who read about the South talk about it either professionally or just casually. You know, people have been saying that the South is dead, there's no more South since the 1860s. Um, you know, they said it after the Civil War. They said it during Reconstruction. They said it during, you know, when, when uh, sort of high-end mechanization came into the South. They said it after the Civil Rights Movement. They're saying it today. There is no Southern culture. We've, we've been homogenized. We've been taken over. I don't, you know, there, there's, a, there's a, another point of view that says, no, the South has retained its fundamental ethic and difference. I, I subscribe to that, and I was just trying to make the, that case. Um, but there's a little bit about the apparatus of secession in the last two chapters, sir. I would like to make a, a comment 
related to what the fellow said from the south. Um, I come from North Dakota, and what I observe going on in North Dakota now with the uh, oil industry going in and punching a hole every couple miles and doing all their drilling and everything, I see there's a way to look at it very superficially and say, well, that's the economics of the South plundering North Dakota, because they really are wrecking the environment. And I think that what's underneath it is not this North-South thing so much as a spiritual bankruptcy in the United States of America that allows and permits people like John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, and any number of people to be assassinated, but idiots like Lindsey Graham and these other people who are obstructionists and prevent the rest of us from living our lives the way we would like to live it are the problem, and they are spiritually bankrupt. Uh, look, I, I agree, and, and I make the point, I make somewhat of that point, maybe not quite as eloquently if you just stated it, but I do think a lot of that comes from the South. It, it, it exists in the North as well, as you clearly know. I mean, people can't walk into North Dakota and punch holes in the ground without the complicit you know, behavior of North Dakotans as well. Uh, so it's, it's, this isn't an, an entirely southern problem, but I do think that that, that is where the stronghold comes from. That is, it is a, a southern ethos that's been hardwired into those states since the 1700s. I mean, you know, they go back to the Continental Congress. There's a lot of people in the south didn't want to join the United States. There was a huge resistance to even getting involved, you know, with the northeast and northern states in the first place. Right, so the, so the question is basically about the, or the comment, it's not just this is not a north-south divide, it's a divide on different, there's a, there's a lot of ways to parse the divides in this country. Um, you can do it, and what was, there was a well-known book, either the six or the nine nations of North America, I forget that Colin Woodard perhaps wrote it. Um, there's the urban-rural divide, there's the religious-secular divide, there's the north-south thing. Um, there's a lot of good arguments to be made for those things, but I, I, I honestly do think that this, Look, there, there are very few people that, that are 20 miles away from anybody on their farm anymore. I mean, there just really are. That's a, that's a, that's a pretty rare individual in this country that lives 20 miles from anybody else. Um, so I, I tend to think that, that the kind of the spirit and the philosophy that is really beneath all of this urban, rural, um, religious, secular, whatever you, however you want to parse it, um, is, is a north-south thing. I think it's a divide that's been in this country forever, since even before the country was founded. And that's kind of one of the points I try to make in the book. However, I will, you know, there's clearly a good argument for what you said. People have written entire books um, kind of trying to understand the divides in this country that way. So I'm not completely refuting what you're saying, but I, I do think that I tend to agree with my own argument. But <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people did say, and you know, I spoke to several political science professors and Southern historians, and many of them said sort of the same thing you said, which is, Look, if this country separates on a north-south divide, there's going to be this balkanization of the entire country that, you know, goes, you know, whether, whatever, north-south, um, northern-southern California. This is a pretty interesting bumper sticker I didn't show you that uh, I found in a lot of places in the south. It reads, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. It's a red state thing. It's got all the, all the classic, it's a cutout with all the classic Confederate southern states, although they've added New Mexico, Arizona, um, Maryland and Missouri, but, and so maybe this is a fairer representation of, of the South, you know, maybe the South isn't, you know, by the way, also in the book, um, I, you know, Kentucky and West Virginia, in, in a lot of measures, if you take, take the data and want to sort of break it down, Kentucky and West Virginia look a lot like this, the Confederacy states, the, you know, the Southern, the slave states. Um, Kentucky and West Virginia were not part of the Confederacy, they were part, you know, West Virginia was created to be a free state in the Civil War. But uh, if you look at just sort of the demographics, the religion, uh, education, a lot of the other sort of um, measures of how people put together society, they look a lot closer to southern states than they do to other ones. Uh, she asked about traveling around the South, talking to people who argue um, positions without uh, bothering to check the facts or you know accept the facts or something like that. 
Yeah, that's the most frustrating thing about this entire book. I've done a lot of radio interviews. I've had a lot of conversations. That's absolutely the most frustrating thing about talking to people from the South about this. I, I made a big attempt. If you read the book, you'll see that there's a lot of research and there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of studies, cited reports, quotes from people, et cetera, et cetera. I really wanted to present a fact-based argument for what I did. To date, every piece of criticism that's come from this book not one single fact, with, with one exception, has been um, disputed in this book. The book does say that Alaska achieved statehood in 1960. as a misprint. It's 1959. That's the only fact that's been tripped up that anyone's bothered to challenge. And I, you know, I, it's, I think you can make the case that it goes back to, to religion, right? There's no factual basis for faith. I mean, I'll accept people's faith and all that, but you've got to accept the fact that there's no factual basis for it. You can't really cite empirical evidence for you know, most religious beliefs, but they're just so attached to these, to this way of thinking that doesn't require facts, and they, it just spills into everything else, whether it's government or, <laughs> that's the basis of my bitch about the BCS football championship, right? It's, it's completely avoids facts about what teams are better, doesn't look at sort of who plays who and who wins games, it's just completely non-fact-based bullshit. But Alabama did probably win tonight anyway, so good for them. Uh -oh. Well, you don't drop by. She asked if I talk <laughs> to Southern Pride. Did you see that building? <laughs> you don't just walk up and knock at the door. So she asks if I spent much time at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, I can tell you that I did, um, and this kind of goes back to the question, the first question over here. Uh, before I did any of my travels, I talked to a couple people at the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, set up a couple of interviews, a woman named Heidi Byrich and a guy named Mark Potok, who, uh, if you listen to NPR or the usual lefty radio shows, you'll hear Mark Potok show up once in a while as the spokesman for Southern Poverty Law Center. I did about a three-hour phone interview with those two, and then I spent, I think I got there 10 in the morning and was with them until about 5 or 5.30, and we cruised around Montgomery. But it's a, it's a heavy security process to get into the Southern Poverty Law Center. They're very suspicious of everybody. I mean, it's not quite a strip search, but, you know, it's like walking into the halls of Congress. They're very paranoid. You can see bullet holes on the wall of their building and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, I went away with a lot of their literature, made some follow-up calls. So, you know, I, I spent a good few days pretty deeply enmeshed in Southern Poverty Law Center culture. And then through the course of my um, research, occasionally I'd send them an email and say, hey, I found this out. Do you know anything about this? Or they'd send me something. So... Yeah, I believe the Southern Poverty Law Center is entirely funded by private donations. They have a huge uh, endowment, I and mean, it's millions and millions, and the people who don't like the Southern Poverty Law Center often cite that and say, well, these people are getting rich off of, you know, their stridency or their, you know, their political opinions or whatever. Yeah. Yes, oh, sorry, I'm going to move on to, does that say scurvy on your, say no to scurvy. All right, I, I think we can all, <laughs> as one, <laughs> we'll unite everyone, I think. Actually, probably not. There's probably a bunch of assholes in Alabama. What? Scurvy? We're, no. <laughs> Northerners taking away our scurvy rights. <laughs> Seriously. Well, that was, right, it's the, uh, I think David Brooks was, if, if Obama came out in favor of motherhood, the, Southern, the South would declare motherhood un-American. I think I included that quote in the book, not mine. Anyway, yes, scurvy lady. Well, probably what surprised me the most was I made, as I said before, I, I made a real big error. I did not want to rehash the truncheons of the civil rights era in this book. I did not want to revisit Reconstruction or the Civil War or Jim Crow. I really wanted to focus on mainstream South as it exists in 2011, 2012, which was when I was doing my research. But what surprised me was how impossible that is to do. There's a great... Uh, I, I also wanted to be the first writer ever to write about the South and not use the William Faulkner quote, uh, the past isn't, what is it, somebody knows it, the past isn't past, it's not even, anyway, there's a great William Faulkner quote that everybody who writes about the South, basically, it, the, the past, history isn't past, the present's not even past or something. Um, but you can't, you can't avoid I discovered that William Faulkner was not only a much better writer than I am, but a much better thinker, so I had to eventually 
you know, look into how this sort of traces from civil rights and Jim Crow and Reconstruction and so on, all the way back to, like I said, Continental Congress. These things have, these divides that we're talking about today, whether they're religious fundamentalism or the way that you want to set up your economy to exploit workers or, or to what degree you're willing to exploit workers, because let's face it, everybody exploits workers, um, the way you want to set up your schools, the way you want to fund your schools, these fundamental divides have been with this country since the 1700s. I mean, they really have. And I didn't, I wasn't aware of that. I really wasn't. And so I was kind of forced to, to deal, with, uh, deal with Southern history in a way that I, I didn't really want to. And the man from South Carolina talked about how the Civil War really stays with people generation after generation. Um, it really does. People talk to me about the Civil War as if it just concluded a few years ago. Um, I actually had a, a relative killed in the Civil War, too, on the Union side. But I, I have to admit, I don't feel that personally, you know, I mean, it's there, but people in the South really do seem to feel that personally. She asked if I toured a plantation. Um, well, yeah, Natchez, Mississippi is probably the most famous place for going to tour these old plantation homes. They filmed some scenes from True Blood at one of them, and I went to that one. Uh, yeah, you go see, you know, they, they, they present these plantation tours as part of Southern heritage. And there's something appealing about them. There's really nice, reconstructed, um, you know, antebellum homes and, you know, whatever the architectural style is, these sort of plantations, with big Greek kind of columns and stuff. They're beautiful houses. They really are. And so you go and you tour the plantation homes. And, yeah, I did do that. They show you where the, the slave quarters were in the kitchen. It's a historic tour. Some of them, some of the tours are more upfront about dealing with the slavery issue than others are. And I wrote a real small bit about that in the book. So yeah, I did do that. In Natchez, and there's a town in Georgia that's well known for that as well. And I went there just for a couple hours. Um, I can't remember the name of it now. I'm not, you know what, Man, I'm not an activist. I really, I don't, I don't care what people do. <laughs> I feel like my only obligation as a writer is to take people to the next page. Seriously, uh, you know what? I, I don't have a suggestion. I mean, the suggestion's right on the cover. It's just a, it's just a big bitch about secession, and I'm not, I'm not trying to crusade or gather people around to really do anything. Um, I don't know. Walmart. Yeah, I guess they're mostly a crummy bunch. I've shopped at Walmart. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I'm not really trying to light fires. You know, it's part of it's to me. It's um, I do have a point to make, and it is a sort of a rant of frustration. That first, the first page and a half of the book, by the way, has been so, every reviewer that wants to shit on this book pulls the very first paragraph of the book out and uses it to, uses it as, to symbolize the entire book. Um, you know, it's basically there for hyperbole. It's a literary device. I don't know when book reviewers, you know, stopped understanding what hyperbole is all about. It's a page and a half rant to get people's attention and then it kind of goes into the meat of the book. But, um, but, I, I don't know. I'm not a crusader. I'm not trying to get you to do anything, except you know, buy my book, I guess. 